This program is an encore presentation. Welcome to Faith Works Live. Here's your host, Rebecca Haney. Welcome to Faith Works Live. Rebecca Haney is my name, and if you're new around here, welcome. I know that there's a, a few folks that have reached out and said, "Hey, this is the first time I'm I'm hearing about you." You know, what is this all about? I am glad you asked. This, <laughs> this is the moment between you, me, and the microphone where we get to focus on the main things. We believe that faith does work as long as your faith is in the right things. That's what we explore here. What does it mean to live the truth? That is Jesus Christ putting all cards out here on the table. He is the answer um, for a lot of the problems that for all the problems that we have today, but what does that even look like in this crazy world? That's what we discuss, believe it or not, right here, every time we have the airspace to do so. And uh, that's usually between me and um, a few other fascinating guests and someone that's been a, a staple of this show ever since the very beginning, uh, since before I got here <laughs> even, is uh, the awesome and uh, the never less than sensational Josh Bingaman. And he is with us in studio today. Some changes have taken place in your life, though, since we last talked, Josh. Uh, and just right off the top, it's great to have you in studio. So nice to see you again. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Since we got a chance to talk. So we get to celebrate some really cool happenings in your life for you and your family. Yeah. So, you know, because I used to be on the radio every week, mm -hmm. very regular. But uh, actually, since March... I have actually been uh, a promoted to the senior pastor position at our church. So really thrilled. I'm the new senior pastor. for been there the last couple months now at First Church of the Open Bible here in Des Moines. It's such a privilege and an honor. And so with that, I haven't been on the radio as much as often, but I still want to be involved when I can be. Um, but, but I'm wearing multiple hats now. Um, and also my role at Harvest Bible College, because I was the director at the mm -hmm. school. Um, but with the transition of me stepping into the senior pastor role, I've moved down and we've transitioned the school to be under the denomination now, so Open Bible Churches, and I'm the dean of academics now, which is still super cool. I love being involved, but it's more of a part-time role for me, and we have other staff people in the school running it now, other aspects of it. And so I've kind of kind of shifted some things around and, and been able to, the Lord's opened new doors for me to serve, and, and so it's just been really awesome uh, just to, to follow God in this new way, in this new season. But I also love being a part of the radio and talking mm -hmm. theology always. Well, and it, it, it gives us such joy when you come in, and uh, I know that when I hear questions from people. I can almost always guarantee I'm like, I bet that was because of something Josh said uh, oh, <laughs> in, awesome. in all the best ways. Like you inspire us to be able to think more deeply about who God is. And that is, I mean, that's always my favorite. And it's been such uh, so awesome to be able to do that and hang out with you on a regular basis. Um, I know you're a super busy guy right now, so I won't call you as often. <laughs> but if you still take the call every once in a while, it's kind of like that bat signal in the sky. He's here. He's here for us when we need him. Only <laughs> Only when the stupidest theological things come around, you'll be like, oh, we got to bring Josh in on this one. People are acting extra dumb. And boy, what do we have today? <laughs> See, that is the secret sauce. That's why I knew the moment that I saw this particular um, argument, let's say, or this mm -hmm. particular thought posited in a in this theological framework, I'm like, I have to talk to Josh. This is it. Like, this is the absolute right combination of ingredients to get Josh Bigaman to come <laughs> back in the studio and talk with us. We need you, Josh. Uh, boy, this one's a doozy for me. Um, broadly speaking, I think we're going to talk about God and gender. We're going to talk about, um, well, tis the season, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about all those rainbows that you yeah, see happy, everywhere. Happy, happy Pride Month, is right? That what we're, see, I've been waiting for Gluttony Month because I yeah. feel like those are my peeps. Yeah, like, what about I, the other six <laughs> sins, right? What, what they be, well, Gluttony, I, maybe Thanksgiving, you know? I feel a little awkward around Pride Month, but I think like <laughs> the gluttony and the covetousness, like all of that other Christmas, stuff. Christmas, covetousness, <laughs> right? I don't know. I don't know. It just doesn't fit. Like Pride, it just really gets its own month. And I, I was under the impression that Pride was a sin, but mm. everyone is pretty much thrilled about it. You've been reading those Proverbs again. Yeah, how That's dare I? That's the problem. Yeah. Pro well, apparently not everybody else reads Proverbs. <laughs> no. So we don't know the direction we're heading. We have parades and everything, and we think it's a good thing. Mm. Um, but in the middle of all of this, you're seeing an awful lot, of, like I said, a lot of the symbolism and a lot of people. You can really tell the, the shift in the power dynamic over the last few years, mm -hmm. just even in the time that I've been an adult and paying attention to social, the, the way that the sociopolitical landscape is constructed. Um, 
it it used to be that companies wouldn't make political statements really, you know, over much of anything. Yeah. They focused on what they did, the product they sold or the service they provided. And now everywhere you look from Hollywood to the business world to politicians, you have Nancy Pelosi on uh, congratulating, like presenting a trophy on RuPaul's Drag Race is a real thing that mm-hmm. happened. Um, and it's not the first time, I guess. Uh, you have school children being used as pawns in the middle of all this, which is probably one of the most disturbing things to me and to many out there, that this has become such a battleground in schools, library story hours, like the most innocent drag things. Drag shows. You they can have children at of. drag shows. They're using our kids. Like, this isn't an area where I think a lot of us can be silent anymore. No. I think we do have to speak up. It's it's encroached so far and become so aggressive that it's very clear that yeah. it's a spiritual battleground. Like, and it's this reprehensible. Is, this it's is the completely spirit of our age. reprobate. It's evil. Mm-hmm. But now we're canceled, so nobody. Yeah, hears dang it! <laughs> Already, we didn't even get to the topic. Canceled. Yet. That's a new record. We're like four <laughs> minutes in. Way to go, Josh. <laughs> uh, no, this is why you're here because you're willing to speak the truth like this, and we. I think we must. I think we can no longer be silent. But I think we need to do so in theologically certain and confident terms. Um, And that doesn't mean hateful and angry, because that's also a problem, right? We don't want to go from pride to fury and, you know, rage, also a problem. Um, But we have to tell the truth. And there are many people who are seeking to find their identity outside of Christ. And at this point, they're also seeking to find their identity outside of the basic biological binary that has been true ever since humanity has existed. We have gone so far into the realm of becoming our own gods Mm -hmm. that we believe we can determine our identity and it has to be something outside even of male and female, right? Or outside of the, again, basic biological procreative order, that very thing from which we all originate. We are rebelling against even that, against the very origin, the very elements of who we are on a genetic level. Like we hate our DNA because we're so um, entrenched in this longing for something for that purpose and fulfillment outside of Christ. That's that's where I take this in my brain. To me, that helps me make sense of what I'm seeing going on in this Romans one type of world. Um, But you're not new to dealing with any of this. And so I look to your voice of experience when I hear some of the crazy theological arguments that I've heard lately. So I went to the font of all modern wisdom, which, of course, is Twitter. And uh, I found a pretty interesting theological argument um, that was not new to you, Josh, but I I had not seen this before. And this is a ostensibly a woman um, named uh, Michaela. Atencio, I'm going to go with, and (laughs) I don't know, hopefully that's close. And she says, I'm non-binary. How does this reconcile with the verse male and female? He created them, you may ask. Well, well, indeed, we've asked. Do you have an answer? She says the variety in God's creation emphasizes creativity as an artist. And Genesis gives us several examples of this. She says God made day and night. That sounds like a binary, similar to male and female, right? But that isn't all we experience in 24 hours. Sunrises and sunsets do not fit into the binary of day or night. Yet God paints the skies with these two. She's got a whole thread of these where she talks about Mm -hmm. binaries, you know, like cloud, like like the, the sea and the land separating those. But, you know, that's not the full story because of marshes and bogs and things where you have wet land, right? So it's like a combination of the two. And she's claiming that because of the glorious variety of God's creation, that that accounts, therefore, um, and ergo, we can expect not, and we can justify non-binary identities in the human experience as well. Um, so what is your take? And we could go into a little more detail if you want, but what is your take on this line of thinking? Uh, it's ridiculous. It is, <laughs> it is just on its face, completely ridiculous. This is clearly a person who does not know Hebrew, who has not done any serious study in Genesis. It really is someone who, who already has a preconceived notion of what they want to be true. And then they are going into the Bible to try and find ways to put it in there. This is a textbook example of eisegesis, which is a theological term. Eisegesis, uh, E-I-S, means to put into. Mm -hmm. So, So eisegesis is putting into the Bible what you wish it would say. 
what we want to do is ex a Jesus, e x ex a Jesus. We're taking out of the scripture what was put there by the original authors, them being the apostles, Moses, the God Himself. Sure. Um, and so this is just a, a vagrant example of someone who has already decided that that transgenderism is is fine with God, and then they're going to find ways to put it in. It, it's if you just read Genesis one and forget anything this person said, when you read the text, you in no way come out with the idea that that there is any kind of of fluidity between these different things, nor. Is Genesis really meaning to talk about binaries? They're taking a modern mindset Mm -hmm. and bringing it into the text of Genesis. Moses is not trying to say day and night are, are somehow akin to male and female. Or, or even uh, separating the waters from the sky to the earth, or, or, or any any of the examples that are given in this mm-hmm. Twitter thread. They they say, well, not all birds fly, right? So so there's a spectrum of animal creatures, and there's a spectrum of the sun setting and the sun rising, and there's a spectrum. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the created order. And the reason why it says there is evening and there is morning, that's poetic. Mm-hmm. It's showing the, the the separate days, and it doesn't matter what time of day it was done. It's showing that God did something each day. It's there's just there's nothing there in the English, in the Hebrew, in the authorial intent to say anything about gender other than the one text that they started with male and female he created them Mm -hmm. the one text that they don't actually even really discuss in the twitter thread um except for one port and we can cover cover that separately but but that's the one the only one that really is delineating an actual binary all the other things are showing god's creative order in the world and how God God proceeded to do that in a very poetic and beautiful way. Mm-hmm. You know what they also have all throughout the animal kingdom, male and female. Yes, and they do. <laughs> You've got to have those basics of biology. Otherwise, there aren't going to be any more penguins. And there's just, there's no more squirrels. Like, that's something that I, I think is, I almost have to giggle a little bit when we have these types of discussions. I know it's incredibly serious and it's probably the major, uh, you know, it, it, battleground that we have to, to fight. Like, this isn't something that we can, uh, um, that we can lose. It, it, this is not an area where we can just resign ourselves to everybody thinking differently and differences of opinion. No, like this is an area where we have to take a stand for truth. I do believe that. But a part of me just smiles at the fact that this is something that orangutans can get right. Mm-hmm. This is something that, you know, chipmunks understand and we don't. We don't seem to understand this anymore. And it's so basic. How can we have gotten to the point where we're so educated and so progressive that we can't even define what a woman is or what a man is anymore? And and that's a real concern because people are allowed to have stupid opinions. They have stupid opinions all the time, whether you have politics or which sports team you think is the best. People can have biased opinions and be wrong. And that's no big deal. You Every time you disagree with me. Yes, that's how it works. That's a stupid opinion. But But you're entitled to that. But you can. (laughs) But, But when you're dealing with these kind of issues... Where you cannot even define what male and femaleness is, where you you are saying things exist that don't exist. There are no they them pronouns. Those don't exist. There are no people with they them pronouns. That doesn't. That's not a thing. And when you confuse fundamental building blocks of human language, human society, and how our stru- or world is structured, and even how we were created, mm-hmm. this is akin to trying to live your life while denying gravity. You're not just denying something that doesn't matter. You're denying something that fundamentally matters and is actually dangerous for how you live your your life in the world. It is actually harmful to society to allow these kind of ideas to to it's like a mind virus worming its way into our children, confusing them and making them ill prepared for the realities of the world. Well, and I think before this conversation is done, we really have to go there because there have been some very high profile situations where people have revealed um, folks who consider themselves transgender, who Mm -hmm. have gone through the process of transitioning and then gone through, um, I guess, detransitioning and the revealing and sharing the pain, the physical pain, as well as all the, the consequences that they will never be able to leave behind. Things that cannot be, un- they've done things to themselves that cannot yeah. be undone. And that's both on a physical level, as well as a psycho-emotional and spiritual level. And the, we 
can't be so ignorant anymore as to say, well, what's the harm? You know, yeah. what does this, wh- why not just be nice? Why not just play along with the gender delusion and just make them feel good, call them whatever they want to be called, you know, and just pretend and it's fine. It's not hurting anybody. That is not true. Yes. That is a lie. Um, and we are hurting people when we refuse to affirm them in the identity as God created them. Yeah. The, the beauty in God's created order of male and femaleness. Yeah, in, in biblical understanding, that, that this is wrong all the way around, but at least for a society. Stepping outside of what the Bible says, we at least should not allow these kind of transitions to happen for children. Right? If, if a, a grown adult, 18 plus, wants to do horrendous things to their body, uh, surgeries that cannot be reversed, mm-hmm. um, they can make those choices. But for children at least... It should be illegal because it is it is wrong on so many levels, including biblically. It absolutely is. Now, when we're looking at this uh, tweet, this Twitter thread, and getting to the one place where she attempts to make an argument about God from creation here, which the beyond the interpretive poetry, I guess is what you could say. Um, she says, male and female, he created them. Then she says, first off, intersex people exist. So she's stating a fact and then saying, well, you know, Scripture can't know everything because here's something that's outside of Scripture. Yeah. That And, and points to that as though it's some sort of evidence for her ph- non-binary philosophy. And that's something that I don't think that we confront enough in the LGBTQIA plus plus uh, dollar sign ha. Um, I think... The the I in that group is lumped in together with a lot of more behaviorally demonstrative chosen identities. Um, and uh, I mean, that's often thrown out there as this like gotcha bomb in debates about gender. Well, you know, male and female, that can't be all there is because, look, there's you know, there's an intersex person over there. So that means that I can live my life however I want to and you can't say anything about it. Yeah, gender is um, meaningless. <laughs> gender is meaningless. Uh, so maybe we should address that. When when you read that, what are your thoughts and how would you respond to someone that says, well, I'm questioning the binary as presented by Genesis or as presented by God's design because of people who are considered intersex? So so first off, clearly obvious is, again, this person is deriving their theology from culture, not from the Bible, because they she reads the text of Scripture and then she said then she says, but culture says that intersex people exist. So obviously we have to interpret the Bible differently. So, so her authority is culture, is the LGBT movement, not the Bible. She is trying to reinterpret the Bible based on what she actually holds as authority. Mm-hmm. So this is completely antithetical to, even though they're quoting the Bible, it's completely against the Christian worldview and understanding. Scripture teaches us, and Scripture says that male and female, he created them. That's the defining statement from which we then should look to the world, not the other way around. But even still, when when they use the word intersex, there are two different kind of groups they're talking about. Uh, first off, there's the group that, that are just people that define themselves as intersex. That doesn't mean that they are genetically intersex. They're just, I'm somewhere in between a boy and a girl, and I feel like this this day, and I feel like that. So sometimes when people say they're intersex, they don't have anything genetically different about them. They're either a man or a woman. They're just, it's just a, a presentation. It's just, you know, a gender choice. Okay. But but there are people, this is a more medical term that's used, where they're, they're actually born intersex. And, and what that generally means is that they are born either with some, with some kind of deformity. Uh, either they will have uh, pieces of both genitalia uh, that have been each, either partially or for, fully formed on their bodies when they're born as an infant, um, or, or they won't have either one clear, uh, clearly defined enough. But it is always, 100% of the time, a genetic d- deficiency that has led to a mutation that has caused these things to grow. Um, and so the one main issue with, with this, there's two, uh, is one is that we don't use the exception to define the rule. Right. And so let's just start with the idea that even if intersex people exist, and they do exist, but we'll, we'll get to the details of why it doesn't mean anything in a minute. But, but even if they do exist, and they are somewhere in between male and female or whatever, um, 
that doesn't mean that male and female doesn't exist and isn't, aren't categories because intersex people are less than like half a percent of people in the world. Like it's so extremely rare. Um, that that it is so uncommon, and just like we have, we we all drive on the road. We have traffic laws, but there an exception exists for ambulances during an emergency. Now, because ambulances don't have to follow traffic laws, does that mean that traffic laws now have no purpose and that mm-hmm. it's all meaningless? No, there is the normal ordered structure of society with how things are supposed to flow, and there is an exception, and it doesn't define the rule. It's an exception to the rule. Right. And so in the same way with gender, even if there are intersex people, that doesn't change the rule. It just means that there is this unique scenario that doesn't neatly fit in the box. It changes nothing about gender whatsoever. And so they're trying to use the minority case to redefine the the whole th- the whole, and that is that is a, a debate tactic and a manipulation tactic. Mm-hmm. They're trying to deceive you and trick you. Don't fall for the bait. The mm-hmm. the bait. And so, so there's that whole side. But even right. still, going back to intersex itself, whenever someone is born intersex, that doesn't mean that they have two functioning forms of genitalia. Never, never, and I mean never, never, are there people with two operating genitalia. Hmm. That person was born either a male or a female, period. Period, period, period. The mutation is just in that there is a non-functioning genitalia that was grown or developed, but they, it's non-functioning. Mm-hmm. You will not have uh, a person who, who has both sets that are functioning. Either they have ovum or they have testes, but only one of those exists in the body and only one of those is functioning. And so in the past, doctors, before they could do genetic tests and things, did have to arbitrarily make a decision on which one they thought were the functioning set and sometimes they made mistakes. That doesn't happen anymore. Doctors don't just look at an intersex baby and randomly pick one and then go to cut, cut, cut. That's not how it works. They will do a genetic test to find out the chromosomes of the child to find out which genetic uh, 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 basis for the genitalia exists because they want to make sure that that corresponds. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is 100% of the time. You will never, ever, ever have someone with a functioning uh, uterus and functioning uh, testes and everything else that that doesn't exist. There are no true intersex people. There's just genetic deformities that occur sometimes in childbirth. Mm -hmm. But one of those is the true gender. Right. And and I'm so glad that you laid that out from a scientific uh, basis, because I think a lot of us are caught with a lack of knowledge about yes. these types of things. We've never had to ask these questions before. Maybe just right now in this tiny little moment in history, it does seem like suddenly this has exploded into mm-hmm. our understanding. And we're like, well, I guess I mean, I don't really know what to say when somebody makes that case. But we do know that people can be genetically determined as to be either male or female. And that has always been the case throughout all of history. We actually can do that now because science, um, we can show whether somebody has XX or XY chromosomes. And exactly. It's, there, there may be a minority of cases where there are some different abnormalities. But as you said, that doesn't give us the right or the justification for overthrowing literally everything else in the human experience up until this point. And the undeniable truth is that without male and female, we cease to exist. I, I just I keep coming back to that because it seems so basic. The more that you mess with that, the more likely it is to uh, lead to, what do you call it, an extinction level event. Mm-hmm. This is what we're doing. It's like we're actively trying to extinct ourselves by becoming so focused on our own chosen identities. Um, interesting thought to me. Uh, which is the kind that I have. Interesting thoughts. Um, I saw a fascinating statistic, um, which maybe this is a good time to take a break. I saw a fascinating statistic that gave me an insight on a group that I didn't really know existed in this whole um, I, rainbow circus tent. And I I was unaware that this applies today. So maybe you can learn from my ignorance. Uh, and Josh could shed some light on this, too. We're talking about gender and genesis. We're talking about understanding, because, of course, it is the season. But perfecting our and our deepening our theology to be able to combat with truth and fact, 
Um, the some of the lies that our culture is not only believing but is purveying and is trying to force down not only your throat but that of your children as well. So how do you combat any lies with the truth? Um, and we'll try to dish out a little bit of that. Hopefully you're involved, interested enough to be part of the conversation. I would love to hear feedback. I'm guessing with this episode I probably will. Um, so check out our podcast. Connect with us on Facebook um, through YouTube. Let us know what you're thinking on this. Some of the questions that you're hearing or things that you thought I'd never really had to think through this before. Um, but we'll return. And, and, and how do we do that? Maybe some things that helped you think through and come to a uh, logically consistent and theologically consistent answer on some of these major, major questions. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. At FaithWorks Live, we're proud to partner with InterVisions Healthcare. In unplanned pregnancy and STD situations, they offer help and hope. It's all confidential and it's all free. If women are in a crisis pregnancy situation, they know that they can get real help at InterVisions. Free pregnancy testing, free STD testing, free ultrasounds as well to see that inner vision. Because women deserve the truth about their bodies, about their baby about all of their options. And if a woman has gone down the road of seeking abortion through medication and she regrets that decision, InterVisions also offers abortion pill reversal procedure, which is a life-saving, <laughs> miraculous um, option to have right here in our own community. InterVisions Healthcare, well worth supporting, providing those free services to women in crisis pregnancy. You can call them 24 hours a day at 515-440-2273. That's 515-440-2273. If you've ever wondered what love looks like, check out Agape Pregnancy Resource Center. They offer free services to help women make informed decisions and prepare for their futures. In particular, in a situation of an unplanned pregnancy, women need to know that the truth about their bodies, they need to know the truth about their babies and all of their options. And they'll find that at Agape Pregnancy Resource Center. Go to agapedsm.com and find ways that you can get involved in this amazing ministry, um, whether it's free pregnancy testing, STD testing, free ultrasounds and counseling, not to mention practical resources, hygiene items, parenting classes, uh, just the, the list goes on. They change lives. This is a place that truly helps people. And if you care about the women in our community, check out agapedsm.com and click on Get Involved today. This program is an encore presentation. Welcome to the madness. This is FaithWorks Live. No, it's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite times of uh, really just any time when Josh Bingaman comes in and he helps us go deeper in our theology. Love to get theological. Um, Josh is now a senior pastor. Yes. Is that the appropriate senior yeah. pastor at First Church of the Open Bible in Des Moines. Um, also the dean of academics for Harvest Bible College, although he's taken a step back from some of, of what he would normally do at the college or what he's previously done so that he can focus on leading the church. So very exciting times for you. And yet he still had time to take this call uh, <laughs> to come in and uh, help us sort out gender in Genesis. Um, how do we understand, again, in the middle of the rainbow wave that we see around us in particular right now as we're having this discussion, but it's just it's it is the, the the water that we're all swimming in right now. It's inescapable. And uh, you mentioned during the break, Josh, that you're doing a Bible study on the book of Jude, mm -hmm. which is a, an action-packed, powerful, one-chapter book. And it is, I think, really instructive for our not that anything in the Bible isn't, but that it's very instructive for our times because it's about defending the faith from false teaching and being willing to contend for the faith. And I think specifically on this subject, the subject of gender and the lies about gender that are being pervaded by our enemy in the culture, um, we see the, the perversion today in the great tidal wave of rainbow all around us. Um, that exists because we have been silent. Yes. That exists because we have not thought it worthy or comfortable, quite frankly, to defend the truth of God when he says, this is how I created you and it is good. 
Uh, and so I don't think this is something we can ignore any longer for our own comfort level or for whatever. This is this is the fight of our time. This is about contending for the faith. Would you agree with something like that? Oh, 100 percent. This is exactly what Jude is warning. He is warning that false teachers have come into the church and they are preaching false messages that are leading people astray. And he is warning them, you have to stand up. You have to say something. And he re- goes after story after story after story from the Old Testament, reminding them that God will not tolerate these things. That God, in fact, in verse seven, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sexual morale. He's reminding them of that in the book of Jude to remind them that God cares deeply about these false teachings and about these sexually immoral practices that are happening not just outside of the church but inside the church. Mm-hmm. And so we have to pay attention. And these teachings that exist outside in the world today are coming into the church to go to the kids in your youth group and ask them what their positions are on gender. You might be surprised. Oh, man. You might be disappointed. I don't need a heart attack. <laughs> yes, because this is this is in the water. This is yeah. everywhere. Every single public school kid is force fed this, yeah. you know, and it, it's it, you can't avoid it. There are a lot of people that 10 years ago had a very biblical understanding of gender, but now they don't even realize that they've changed because everyone else has just changed their opinion. And quite honestly, a lot of people just kind of go along to get along. If it's the popular thing, then then we're into it, too. And, and so it, it really really has led our culture and the church needs to carefully choose its words but speak on this issue because we can't avoid it any longer the world needs the truth before it falls into further delusion and lostness which will not last forever you can't believe a lie forever and have it work out for you but you can believe it for a long time until it ruins you and then the world will move on without the western world that that's africa and and asia can can develop their own cultures as america collapses and the west collapses under the weight of our own foolishness if we if that's the future we want then sure keep going with this but if we want to have a future for our people Mm -hmm. as a church and just as a society we have to address this well and you'd think that that could inspire you to stand up when you weren't willing to before like okay the the fate of the entire world and all of the future of everything that you've ever heard of and valued and held dear rests on this one question yeah i guess that's enough to get me off my couch maybe (laughs) to speak up maybe maybe it's it's for the kids Right. That's what we're seeing more and more. And I alluded to this earlier that the battleground is for the hearts and minds of our children. Yes. Your and not just every kid, like the general society kids. It's it's your kids, like your specific 12 year old, 10 year old, eight year old child um, that that's they have targets on them in a spiritual sense as well as a cultural sense. And we see that, I mean, left and right, we're seeing children specifically becoming um, the being involved in, like we said, drag shows, being dragged literally mm-hmm. to some of these big events where they're exposed to a completely inappropriate um, sexuality, mm-hmm. not just because it's LGBT, but because it's so graphic. Um, and like, yeah, I don't I'm know what it takes. taking kids to strip clubs too, right? right. Like, I'm it against doesn't matter all of if it. it's hetero. That doesn't, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not what we're saying. The point is that's very inappropriate for children and our culture is actively celebrating this. You mentioned in one instance um, just recently here where uh, a uh, an MLB team, the, the, Rays? the uh, Rays, the Tampa Bay Rays, they had put chosen to put a rainbow insignia on their patches on their uniforms. And this is something a team just did. And there were a few players that objected to this. Mm-hmm. And there were five. And they said, and they they made it very clear, they did in, in as gentle terms as I can possibly imagine them saying, they released a statement and they said, we love everybody. We want everybody to be welcome at the games. You know, we're not trying to be, you know, distra- hateful or divisive in any way, but we, our religion cannot allow us to, to promote what God says is wrong. And they, they said the name Jesus. Yes. They were very specific and they said we're Christians and Jesus um, dictates how we live our lives, right? We are, we are not our own. And as a result, we can't call good or celebrate what God says is wrong and devastating to humanity, right? Yeah. In and, fact, I and think- they became... <laughs> 
<laughs> the, the, the talk of the town, and not in a good way, they were called a lot of names as well, were simply standing up and saying, I, I can't partake in this. Yeah, and in fact, I think it was even, this. even more less aggressive because I don't think they said anything about it. They just chose not to wear the patches. Mm-hmm. So they just played the game like normal, wearing their normal uniforms, no rainbow flags right. on it. it and then they, they were approached yes. for a comment mm-hmm. by the reporters, and that's when they said something. So they were not trying to make a statement. They were not trying to make a protest of any kind. They were just, they going they were about just life trying to live their lives as Christians, but the world doesn't want to allow them to. On mm-hmm. ESPN, they were called hateful bigots because and saying that this was per- they they were actively persecuting the LGBT community by choosing to not wear an, a rainbow pin. Right, that's the point where it's become you must support this or else we will come after you. Mm-hmm. And and you must let us have your children. As yes. well. How dare you try to exempt them from a drag them to a pride parade activity put on by, you know, the community or the school or whatever. That is not an exaggeration. That's just an amalgamation of a lot of things that are happening all at once. And if you don't believe me, see libs of TikTok. Yes. Because um, that's it's on a there great, every day. <laughs> you know, if you really want to be sad and depressed about the, the direction of the world, just follow libs of TikTok on Twitter. Um, but there was something that I discovered, and I always love l- learning new things, although sometimes I question that dedication. But I, I learned a new thing when I was reading a recent survey about sexuality. You said question your youth group and find out where, where they stand on this. It's very, very clear that the younger you go on questions of sexual identity and gender, mm-hmm. um, that the culture has trended so far down this road of self-expression through new gender fluidity that um, you hear things like anywhere between 30 and 40 percent of the upcoming generation. So your kids or grandkids right now um, are identifying as something other than male or female as somewhere in the LGBT or some kind of sexuality. Umbrella. Yes. Um, but <clears throat> something that they considered in this statistic, which I think I'll, I'll try to link to it so I, I get it right. But what they considered within the LGBT umbrella Um, were people who identified as queer, quote unquote, but do not display that in their behavior. Mm -hmm. So there being a distinct difference between a, let's say, a a girl, a female, who would consider herself cisgender, which is the new term, which just means, you know, attractive. Normal. 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 (laughs) Um, uh, So she would still wants to consider herself queer or adopt that as a label. Yes. But has not, that wouldn't be a change in anything that, that she does or who she is other than she wants to adopt this new identity. And that's okay now. That's apparently within this whole rubric of alternate identity is women who are attracted to men who find themselves, you know, who would express themselves in that way, but still want to be considered part of the the gay um, quadumvirate. Yes. Yeah, it, it really is a very popular in thing to to consider yourself in the younger generation a part of the LGBT movement. It's almost like you're not cool if you're not a part of it. And so there's a lot of pressure for kids yeah, to not identify cool anyway, in it. So I guess that shouldn't take uh, me by Another surprise. sexuality that's become very popular that means almost nothing is called demisexual. I know a number mm, of people right. my own age that have come out as demisexual. Really? Demisexual just means that you only want to be in a sexual relationship with someone that you are extremely emotionally connected to. Also known as you mean like normal, normal people. <laughs> normal right? I want to have an emotional relationship. I don't want to have a hookup. Right. I want to love someone. They, mean, that's considered Josh, a queer sex identity should now. Should be meaningful. What sex- you should <laughs> what? only have it with someone who is special to you, maybe even married to. <gasps> what mind radical, blown. radical. We need to invent <laughs> a new sexuality where you only have intercourse with someone that you've committed lifelong to. That's wild. That's crazy. That's not the nearest, marriage. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> something. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, right? We're going so crazy. We're marriage. coming all the way back around to monogamy again. <laughs> Monogamy is cool again, kids. <laughs> Pass it on. <laughs> but that's that's the thing is that it, there is there is cultural pressure because LGBT is a secular religion in addition to all the other stuff it is. And you have to subscribe to it. Yes. Right. Otherwise, you are persona non grata. You're a heretic. Right. right. You're an unbeliever, and you must be. You know, just like they burn the witches, we need to burn the non-believers. Mm-hmm. Well, and this is something that I think 
I, I choose to park here and emphasize how serious I think this is because I still run into many people who are afraid to speak up. Yes. Right. And so we talk about contending for the faith. That can be difficult. And so I don't mean to to condemn people for being, you know, maybe a little less pugnacious about some of these things or a little less vocal than than I might be. Um, I'm just kind of naturally in there as a debater. Like I enjoy I enjoy that um, maybe a little more than I should sometimes. But uh the there are many people who want to be genuinely kind, loving towards their yeah. neighbor, and that's wonderful. That is uh, that's how we should be living as Christians. But that has led some to back off about some of these, like to not confront the the lies that are now taking over our culture, that have declared dominance, that have de- asserted um, their rule in this culture. And I think we've reached the point where it's not an option to be quiet anymore. And and part of the reason that I say that is if you look at who we are as people, we derive our dignity. And the Judeo-Christian worldview has always pointed back to Genesis mm-hmm. and said each and every human being has worth and dignity. Because Why? Why? I mean, that's a worthwhile question because not all um, you know, historically and religiously, not everybody thinks that. Yeah. Evolution that equal. attributes no value or dignity to human life. Right. So it's not a given. Humans are just evolved animals in evolutionary terms. And so there is no actual value intrinsic to a human being. Mm -hmm. Right. Not in a Darwinian point of view. Correct. And in other, you know, other religions have different ways that they think about people. And sometimes, well, you're just inherently bad because that's. You're you're of this caste, right? You know, And so karma decided that this Mm -hmm. is where you belong. And I'm not going to, you know, think any differently about you because clearly you did something. You must have been a terrible person to be born as, you know, a blind beggar on the street. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Judeo-Christian worldview is different. We derive what you sometimes hear us call the Imago Dei. We, we derive our dignity from being made in the very image of God, given the breath of life from God. And how did he create us? Male and female. And he said that it was good. And Jesus repeats this. For those of you who are more like red letter types that say, well, that was the Old Testament. Jesus repeats this in his discussion, in his honoring of marriage mm-hmm. and in, in the sermon the, on the mount in, in, and he says for this reason god created them male and female right and he like this is true there's just no getting around it if you want to claim that the bible is true and that you follow mm-hmm. christ then you also have to understand this and our identity is centered in god's identity and what he and how he is revealed by women being women and by men being men. And I find that a wonderful and and a little bit mysterious, a little bit confusing sometimes, I get it, how all of that works together to display his glory and his uniqueness. Um, And if we get away from, like this um, person was attempting to say, well, this can still support, you know, a non-binary identity and all those things, it really can't. It really can't. And I think that if we ignore that, we're doing nothing less than denigrating the image of God, the, the of God himself, but also the image of God in us from which we derive the the entire dignity of the human race is hinged on that. Yeah. And that that's the real thing. If you want to follow the LGBTQ movement, you sure can. I'm not going to stop you. Nobody's going to stop you. Rock and roll on that. But stop telling people the Bible says is OK mm. because you're lying. You're lying to people. You're deceiving people. It, that's completely wicked. Okay, if you want to follow a non-Christian path for your life, then do it. D- do it. Do what you want. Your choice. But right? stop saying the Bible agrees with you because it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's something that I kind of wonder about when I have discussions with people. And I've started to even ask this. Um, if somebody throws scripture at me as mm-hmm. kind of those gotcha verses um, to say, well, what about this? What about this? I'm happy to address that. And I'd love to talk with you about it. First of all, though, tell me one thing. Do you really care? Yeah. Do you really care what God's word has to say? Do, like, do you think yeah, do you that believe has, it has any power impact authority on on your life? Does it have any authority to you? Does it matter to you what God says, um, or not so much? Yeah. And if that's the case, then we can still have a conversation. But I kind of know, you know, it, it at least gives me context for where you're coming from. And I mean, we can defend scripture all day, but if it's not, if ultimately someone says, "Okay, I don't care what God says, I'm going to live my life anyway," then at least there's some honesty. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, whenever I hear people there. say, well, the Bible says you can't have shellfish and you can't touch a football, so you don't, you know, then what does it say about gay? Anytime I hear someone, you know, say that, I roll my eyes mm-hmm. all the way to the back of my head <laughs> because they clearly got that off YouTube and they clearly right. don't know what the heck they're talking yeah. about and they have no understanding of the new covenant and what Jesus has taught or anything. Mm-hmm. They're just quoting bad arguments they heard from someone else and they don't really care what the Bible says. They're just trying to use the Bible as a ham- as a weapon against Christians, and they're trying to find Christians who aren't educated in the Bible to use that against. Right. But the truth is, their arguments suck, they don't make sense, and they're not biblical. They're, and, it's easily swatted away. Exactly. Well, and that's not you, if you're listening to the show right now. In fact, we did a whole episode once upon a time dealing with that same argument, yeah. Josh. So you can find that in the arc. I'll see if I can can bump that up a little bit, because that'd be a good one to, to dust off as well. But if you're listening to the show, you are equipped, or you're getting equipped. That's always the, the goal. And we are together being equipped to contend for the faith well, reasonably, even winsomely, um, but not without cost. Yeah. Not without cost. And let me take just a real quick break because you mentioned YouTube. And I think a lot of people are saying, well, you know, why does it matter why these crazy opinions are out there? It matters because they have influence. And in particular, it's a, it's a way to outsource your scholarship to somebody else. Somebody puts it, and my kids do this all the time. They're like, hey, I saw this thing. I'm like, where did you see this? <laughs> this proof about who invented the refrigerator? Like, where did you see it? Did you look it up on your own to see if they were right? Well, I saw it on YouTube. And no, I didn't do my own research after that. We just kind of assume that, uh, well, it must be right because I saw it on the internet. And um, there's an interesting video that I saw on the internet. So with our last few minutes, I'd like to talk a, a bit about this argument. And if there's a way we can think through it, confront it, you know, what you would say in response as our resident theologian. Josh Bingaman uh, is with us on Faith Works Live. We'll be right back for a couple more minutes on the other side. When you love people, you cook them tasty food. And there is no tastier food uh, for my money and for my family than Animus beef. And they are so good at what they do. It's naturally raised beef. And in fact, there's several opportunities. You've had to be on a wait list because of how good and how popular their products are. Well, now there's new opportunity right now. Act now to get your Animus beef. There's no steroids or antibiotics. It is all natural farm raised butcher beef. And you can pay processing at the locker fees. They, they help walk you through all of the process. It's a little bit different than going to the grocery store, but it is well worth it. You get great value for your money and they help walk first time customers through the whole process. Now is the perfect time to provide great quality food for your family. And it just doesn't get better than Animus beef. So go to their website and start looking at your order today, whether it's half a cow or freezer full, whatever you need to fit your family, they'll help you out. It's animusbeef.com. That's O-H-N-E-M-U-S beef.com. <laughs> Now is the time to stand for life. For 50 years, Iowans for Life has been the longest standing nonprofit pro-life organization in Iowa, and they stand strong today as pulse life advocates. They believe in defending the defenseless, and that's what we need now, a new generation to value the sanctity of all human life from fertilization till natural death. They advocate at the Capitol, in classrooms, at events across the state of Iowa on abortion, on family planning, on physician-assisted suicide, euthanasia, basically every issue where the culture is so contrary to what God calls us to, they're standing in the gap as defenders of the defenseless, and they're a voice for the voiceless because they believe in the value of life. And if you do too, sign up for their newsletter and get involved today at pulseforlife.org. That's pulseforlife.org. This program is an encore presentation. We're in the home stretch here on FaithWorks Live. It is Always and ever my joy to be joined by Josh Bingaman, and we love it when we get theological. He is the senior pastor now at First Church of the Open Bible. Congratulations again. And he still has time to answer my calls every once in a while. So um, we won't be hearing from him as regularly as we're used to, which is sort of a sad face. But very glad that he's able to join us today and uh, on occasion when we're real stumped and lost, which about gender, we are <laughs> real stumped and lost. So let's break this down. God created them male and female. That doesn't really leave much room for anything else. I mean, everybody that's ever existed, God did create them in his image, and he made them either male or female, Um, period. 
basically. Yeah, it's just <laughs> like, that easy. We've settled that, This right? really shouldn't be that hard. But there has been, of late, um, you know, the place where we all go to for wisdom and instruction, uh, social media. Mm-hmm. And I saw this one actually on Instagram, which was uh, a young lady that does um, theological and also sociopolitical videos. Um, and she talks about God and gender, in particular, the, the how that reveals itself in the power dynamic, and starts asking questions like, well, why do we assume that God is male? And she's not the first or the only one to ask this, but it's a, just an example of how our culture is seeking to ask these types of questions and maybe frame, just maybe, framing them incorrectly or unfairly. So here's an example of how these questions are brought up. How do we know that God is male? Why do we call God Father? And um, I don't think... I do not think some of these words mean what she thinks they mean. So I'll let her speak and then we'll respond. Why do we so often refer to God as he, him, or father? Well, the Judeo-Christian God was written about in a male-dominated time period and culture. Women of this time could not read, write, educate themselves, own property, have money. So female gods didn't have a lot of authority, much less the power to carry out a monotheistic religion where they were the exclusive deity without a male counterpart. It would have been highly unlikely for people to follow a monotheistic religion with an exclusively female goddess referred to as she and mother when the she's and mothers of that time had very little power. And second, historically, there's simply been a lack of emphasis on the female attributes of God. For example, in Hebrew, the word Yahweh is actually half male, half female, likely the author's way of indicating the divine nature of God outside of our binary categorizations of gender. God is referred to as mother and female all throughout the Bible. Here are a few passages. In conclusion, the Judeo-Christian God was created in a male-dominated world and continued to be translated and talked about as such because the fields of theology and translation also continued to be dominated by men. But there has been incredible progress as religious communities begin to ask, what can we learn from God's femininity? And I encourage you to do the same. All right, Josh. So I saw you taking notes over there. Oh, yeah. And she brought up Hebrew, which I know you're going to want to talk the linguistics on that. But um, you mentioned that she might actually have a point there at the end, even if it's worded incorrectly, about God and femininity. Yes. So so she talks about how we need to learn about the femininity of God. And that's a wrong statement. But what is a right statement is that all femininity comes from God because right. God's a creator of male and female. So women can learn more about who they are in God and who they are as persons by looking to God because they are made in the image of God. So masculinity has its source in God. It's a good thing. Femininity has its source in God. It's a good thing. And so, yeah, there is room for you to understand what it means to be a woman by looking at the nature and character of God. But it is wrong to say that there is a divine feminine. Mm. Like that, that, that's not something that God has ever revealed of himself. That's again, eisegesis, the society of today trying to put modern things into what the scripture has never said. Mm -hmm. Well, and there are a few passages that are worthy of consideration where God talks about himself as Mm -hmm. a mother, right? The Mm -hmm. compassion of a mother. And even if a mother were to forget her, her nursing child, I will not forget you, Israel. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful portrait of God, but um, that pales in comparison to the sheer number of times where he refers to himself as him. So yeah. if you believe he, in God's his word, pronouns are like, he, him. you kind of have to <laughs> respect them. Respect his pronouns. <laughs> he doesn't get to choose his own pronouns. Come yes. on now. Yes. Not to mention when he literally came to earth as Jesus Christ, he was born as a man and he yes. was circumcised and everything. Uh, so like we're, we're clear, pretty clear about that. Jesus calls God Father. Um, so let's get into a little bit of that in the Hebrew. I know we've just got a few minutes left. So quick Hebrew lesson. Yes, Hebrew is a gendered language, yes. like many, many languages other than English. But that doesn't mean that God was just arbitrarily assigned a male um, article or something, a male pronoun, and, and that we've been getting it wrong all these years, right? No, no. The Bible is very clear. And, the, and gendered words in language are not arbitrary. Arbitrary. They sometimes are arbitrary, but you would always refer to a man with the male gendered pronouns right. and female with the female gendered pronouns. And so it's not always arbitrary. They're, 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 they're trying to make too much out of something that, that's not really there. The Bible is very clear about this. She, she mentions that, that Yahweh has both male and female in it. That's not actually true. I think she's got it wrong because we don't actually know what the vowels of Yahweh are, so we don't really know what the entomology of that word is. I think she's talking about the word Elohim, which is means a generic name for God. And that's not a word the Hebrews invented. So the word Elohim doesn't teach us anything about the Christian or Jewish God, because that's a word that predated the Jewish writing of the scriptures. Mm-hmm. It's just a generic word for God, lowercase g, that yeah. we use in the Bible as well. 
Right. And we I don't think we have to be Hebrew scholars in order to understand this, but it it is worth unpacking a little bit of some of these, I would say, accusations or arguments, yeah. because it's all too easy to just take somebody's, you know, facts, quote unquote, at face value. And if you don't know what the word for God is in Scripture, it's too easy to be be deceived or at least to be cowed into silence. Yeah, and that's don't, how these don't let videos are presented. Bully you with their knowledge and, and make you be like question the Bible because mm-hmm. of something that they bring up arbitrarily that, that really doesn't even mean what they're saying it is. But mm-hmm. but since you don't know it, it's, it seems r- pretty potent. You have to be careful about that. Right. And uh, ultimately, I think she let slip a lot of ideas about God and power mm. and that this is part. It's, it's really more sociopolitical commentary on anything, yes. right? That this is about women taking back power by understanding themselves rightly and you know we've been deprived of power for too long because it was all the patriarchy that tried to keep us down and using scripture to do it i'm not saying that's never happened where men haven't twisted scripture in order to gain control in fact that's probably the history of most of the world where men have twisted the truth men and women yeah. have twisted the truth in order to gain their own power and their own selfish ends and that is why god sent his son his son note the pronouns <laughs> to be our savior, to be the propitiation for our sins and currently sits at the right hand of the father preparing a place for his own and he's coming soon. So Amen. it makes sense. It may, <laughs> like this is our calling. This is our mission. We cannot be uncertain about the basics of reality anymore, but that's the truth, like it or not. And uh, if you like it, and I hope that you do, it will set you free. He will set you free because truth has a name. Um, and uh, if you are just engaging in this conversation, I'm so glad that you are. It does take courage sometimes to stand up and speak that truth. Um, but uh, the culture is making it even easier than, than ever before to stand out. So, you know, that's kind of a silver lining in the middle of this rainbow clouded field. Um, Josh Bingaman, it is always a joy to talk with you and to, to learn from you. Thanks so much for coming in. I'm glad to be here. Well, and if you still answer the phone, <laughs> if you still answer for the now, phone, right? we'll have you back anytime. <laughs> Doors always open. Um, and me, I'm so glad that you have taken the time to um, to check this out, to engage with us and to be able to consider these questions. Again, it's not easy. It's not easy, but I'm not sure why we expect that it would be. Anything worth having and worth doing and worth being doesn't come easy. Um, But in light of eternity, it's all going to be worth it, right? This is a little blip here and now, here and gone. But the word of the Lord stands forever. And that's why we need to live in it and allow that to be our guide rather than the shifting sands of culture. And what do they have? What do they have to offer anyway? Nothing when compares to the treasure of eternity. Um, So with that in mind, we do have a mission. So let's be about it.